Hello everyone and welcome to the book launch of the Sublime in Everyday Life, Psychoanalytic and Aesthetic Perspectives. We're very pleased to have you with us tonight to celebrate the launch of our book that has been co-edited by me, Anastasius Gaitanidis, and my co-editor, Polona Kerk. Polona will start uh, today's book launch with a short introduction to the book. That will be followed by a series of presentations of uh, the contributors' chapters. Justin Murray will start with his own uh, brief presentation of a summary uh, of his chapter. That will be followed by Anna Simo. Agnieszka Piotrowska will uh, present her chapter next. Chris Vlachopoulos will present his chapter after Agnieszka. And finally, Daniel Rubinstein will present uh, the short summary of his uh, chapter. I will conclude uh, tonight's presentation with a, a brief presentation with my, of my concluding thoughts and um, a little paper that I've written for the occasion, which I hope you will appreciate. Uh, before uh, we start uh, the presentations, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of those who are either present tonight and deciding not to present, uh, like uh, Onel Brooks, uh, who wrote a chapter on ordinary idolatrous pleasure and the faithful functioning of an adolescent boy, a beautiful chapter. Thank you very much, Onel. And then uh, Kiris Jivazi, who is again present tonight, but decided not to present. Um, his chapter is called The Lure of Humiliation, Sublime Aspects to Success in the School Mathematics Class. Thank you very much, Kiris, for your presentation, Naria. And I recognize that you want to be present, but you, you don't want to present your, your summary of the chapter. That's absolutely fine. Um, now, uh, there is uh, someone else who is very important to me because he was my supervisor and friend from New York. His name is jo uh, Joseph Newarth and uh, a very good friend, the supervisor. Uh, his, uh, his chapter is called Experiencing the Sublime Through Encounters with the Real. Thank you very much, Joseph, uh, for your uh, contribution to the book. It's a, it's a wonderful chapter and I very much appreciate your contribution. But before I start, I would like to introduce uh, Polona, my co-editor, who will give you a brief introduction to the book. Um, Polona, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us, also from me. Um, it's a bit overwhelming, the, the numbers, uh, in both scary and exciting ways, as it pertains for today's theme of the sublime. And I also thank you, I want to thank you to people that are joining us from other time zones where it's either early or quite late in the day um, now, so thank you. Um, this book was a project I inherited. Um, it was initially planned by my co-editor, Anastasius, and our late colleague and friend, um, Tessa Adams. It is thus intrinsically somewhat different than what, my, what I might have done if I started from scratch. Um, above all, I have felt in some sense quite uneasy about uh, speaking about the idea of the sublime or the experience of the sublime. It feels at the same time a kind of lofty concept and um, too personal. The book was also inevitably going to be um, different from what Tessa had perhaps imagined, uh, given her uh, interest in the sublime in relation to art. Uh, but I think the book has managed to do something that she might have hoped for as well, uh, to show that the sublime can be a vehicle for sharing a part of psychic life at the border of the subjective and the social, while pertaining to something quite ordinary and everyday. In the book, we try to explore the idea of the sublime as a vehicle of a kind of solidarity that supports a belief in a different reality, or at least manages to surprise us and shake us out of just accepting the existing one. With our contributors, we argued that the sublime permeates our everyday life in the experiences of theater, art, music, and above all, togetherness. One of our contributors, Agnieszka Piotrowska, described it as a book about love. 
um, this is love, not in a sentimental or romantic sense, but in a sense of developing through patient attentiveness, a feeling of connection, something that, for example, Onel Brooks's paper describes very beautifully and in detail. This sense of connection can transform even the most mundane and minute experiences into such an aesthetic object that supports healing, finding emotional truth and capacity to feel. Our contributors, on the other hand, also deployed the idea of the sublime as a tool to expose the fictional, ideological and constructed nature of some of the reality we believe in, the absurdity of its obsession with uncertainty, uh, with certainty and control, or its setting up specific identities as if in possession of certain knowledge or mastery, indeed, as sublime ideals. Daniel Rubinstein points out in his paper in this book that what may appear as rational responses can be limiting in irrational times. Our book was submitted to the publishers in late February 2020, literally days before the world encountered something quite unbelievable and shocking. But as Françoise Lavoine, whom I want to thank here for her generosity and support for this project, reminded me in her recent email, these are also times where ordinary life has been bringing so many more nonsensical moments, moments out of our routines. So the space for the sublime to happen is enlarged. We have to be present in the moment to react to this potential. I could summarize here the themes in the papers. They range from interpersonal, social, cultural, educational, and political arenas of sublime experiences. But this would not only be too dry a description for these papers, but such an attempt of classifying would be um, going against the essence of this book. What the paper convey about the sublime, I think they enact, as it were. They're all very moving. If you manage to read at least some of them, which I hope you will, they will create an experience of an encounter with, or at least witnessing, of something quite special. I have found it a privilege to be entrusted with their first versions, to feedback in our readings and co-shape their final thoughts. I would like to thank all the contributors for their trust in working with us. I want to conclude back at the story of my inheriting this project. As some of you might know, I was out of the academia or any research for several years. So when I finally had the time and resources to try to take part in it again, I first contacted several people whom I had known years before. Most of them were pretty skeptical that, realistically speaking, I would have a chance against people without a gap on CV and with long lists of publications. But when I contacted Anastasius after years of not being in touch, um, he just said, well, actually, I have this book project in my drawer that I was wanting to do for a long time. Maybe we could co-edit it together. It is hard to convey the enabling feeling of this response and the shift that it created in my belief in what I can do or what is possible in reality. So with this project that was kind of gifted to me, now in reality and on paper, perhaps one of its messages is an encouragement to collect, foster and seek Every, such everyday sublime moments for each other and for ourselves, even when they may sometimes feel as just unconnected scraps and fragments, as their effects may surprise us. So this was in a way of short introduction and I pass it back to Anastasios now to introduce the first speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Polona. I'm very moved by your uh, appreciation of my invitation and uh, your account of how we came to work together. Uh, you have been an invaluable presence in my life and without you, this book uh, wouldn't have been uh, possible. Uh, you came uh, as a rescuer to save this project, literally to save this project. And uh, I, I couldn't be more grateful to you for all the hard work you've done and uh, all the support you've given me throughout the last two years. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Um, I would like to move now to our first presenter, uh, Justin Murray. Justin is going to present his uh, chapters, or his chapter on Aginus, uh, the Latin philosopher who introduced uh, the notion of the sublime. Uh, Justin uh, has done a wonderful job in describing uh, Loginus' introduction of this concept, but also uh, he has criticized Loginus 
and uh, he's tried to fight uh, the applications of the sublime in everyday life in the Chinese writing itself. So Justin, thank you very much for writing this wonderful chapter. Justin is a director and theater maker whose work has been seen nationally and internationally. He left Durham University with a degree in classics. He has trained extensively through the Young Vic Directors Program. He recently directed The Wizard of Oz at the Scoop in Moore London Riverside as part of London's free open air theatre season. Justin was Associate Director of Factors of Dionysus, who he directed at Iguni. Justin is Artistic Director of Catharsis and has directed the previous five shows, Hippolytus, Hecuba, Perched, The Complete Greek, Greek Tragedies, and Asurbanipal. Justin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. As um, I hope is kind of becoming clear, entirely opposed to any kind of everyday or ordinary sort of phenomenological uh, conceptions of the sublime. So I thought I would sit down and have a look at why Longinus was so obsessed with um, aiding on this idea and do a bit of a kind of a psycho psychoanalytic like deconstruction really of his text. Um, this kind of philosophical treatise, kind of in the way that like a literary critic might do like a, a Freudian reading or a Lacanian reading of a literary text um, and to kind of see what, what instabilities or sort of slippages of meaning we might find or what, what could we deduce with our sort of psychoanalyst hat on without really being a psychoanalyst at all, as I'm sure. Um, many people here are um, of like where Longinus's head goes in this in this text really and like who hurt him why 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 are we so um, so radically opposed to this idea and as it turns out the sort of sources of instability are many um, really was was uh, the conclusion that I came to um, and there are lots of different ways that we can kind of pull this apart um, to take on one very brief example um, he's very keen on kind of going through and um, discussing the relative merits of different authors and saying why we like some and we don't like others. He's very interested in Homer, in discussing Homer, um, but even within the discussion of Homer, he is, um, elements kind of come out in his own descriptions of Homer that belie his own obsession with the, um, the sublime as literary. Um, he sort of um, consistently compares different elements of Homer to like, we might think that Homer in the Odyssey is like the sun setting, whereas the Homer who wrote the Iliad is the sun blazing brightly in the sky sort of thing. And it's kind of fascinating that not only is Longinus talking about Homer using the simile, like if we, if we associate Homer with any literary device, it can only be the simile, um, and, and also talking of, about it in language that relates to nature, which is an area that we would more readily in modern senses associate with the sublime, which we might connect with sort of Freudian ideas of like the return of the repressed or like um, something that we are, something that's, that's being hidden away or boxed off, kind of coming back in a kind of repressed way in the text. There's also a weird kind of political slant to Longinus, like about three quarters of the way through, we, we sort of pivot to this discussion of like how the only way to save ourselves from the, uh, the sort of decline of, of um, humans around the world, around civilization, is a kind of bureau like autocratic authoritarian dictator figure actually. This is a sort of um, inevitability in the kind of first century AD milieu where Augustus is now the kind of ruler of the known civilized world. Um, but um, Longinus seems really keen to like prop up political ideologies with conceptions of the sublime in really the way that Zizek uh, like observes in his discussion of the sublime doing so. That's maybe a little bit more of a reason for us to treat Longinus's uh, allergy to, to wide, broader conceptions of the sublime um, with some care. 
so there was a lot to unpick here was um uh was the overall um conclusion that i came to and this is really interesting if we if we imagine perhaps that that long the, these are earliest thoughts on the sublime have maybe seeped into later later thinkers even down to our own day even not deliberately perhaps that like if there is any um in in quarters where there might be resistance to um conceptions of the sublime as being as kind of broad and intersubjective as they are in um in this volume it might be that longinus is at the core at the root of it so yes yeah, thank you very much Thank you, thank you, Justin. Uh, thank you for your wonderful uh, brief introduction to your chapter, which is uh, full of um, uh, uh, surprises, but also full of uh, you know deconstructions of Longinus and Sublime, and wonderful deconstructions. Now I would like to move to Anna Simo, um, a colleague and friend from. Uh, from uh, Rockhampton, from my days in Rockhampton. Uh, uh, Anna Simmer is a professor of drama therapy at the University of Rockhampton, a drama therapist, and so. Uh, she's a visiting professor of drama therapy at the University of Osicek, Croatia, and uh, honorary member of the uh, Societa Professionale di Drama Therapy in Italy. There are a lot of um, um, uh, wonderful contributions that uh, Anna has made, uh, but uh, fundamentally she's the senior uh, se uh, series editor of Drama Therapy Approaches, Relationships and Critical Ideas, published by Routledge, as this book also, The Sublime, is published by Routledge, so we are in a, in a good home here. <laughs> so, um, over to you and the, the pre presentation of your chapter, How Theatre uh, how theater, the sublime in the everyday, how theater crafts art out of the ordinary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anastasios. And hello, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here. Now, I'm going to begin, because I'm a drama therapist, in inviting you into a little participatory exercise a little experience. Please do not be alarmed or try to leave at this point. I want to invite you to start thinking of the pleasures in your life right now. Whatever comes to mind. And you're going to have three options. You can write down a list of what they are. You can look around you and just think of what they are. You can close your eyes and remember. And I'm going to give you a timed minute to do that, which begins now. You have five seconds left of your minute. And there it is. So I invite you to take those pleasures and put them somewhere safe to enjoy for yourself later. Now, I brought a friend with me tonight who appears in my chapter and really, really wanted to be here. 
I couldn't stop him. And that's Bertolt Brecht. And this is what Brecht records in a poem which is called Pleasures. The first look out of the window in the morning, the old book found again. Enthusiastic faces, snow, the change of the seasons, the newspaper, the dog, dialectics, taking showers, swimming, old music, comfortable shoes, taking things in, new music, writing, planting, traveling, singing, being friendly. And I want to thank two friendly people here, and that's Anastasios and Palona, for the pleasures of working with you. Thank you for inviting me to contribute to this book. I think you've been exceptional editors, astute, thoughtful, but also patient and very kind. And finally, I would like to quote from the conclusion of my chapter. It has aimed to locate the discussion in the cultural political dynamics of dialectical materialism. In this respect, it does not propose the sublime as the synthetic harmony of transcendence, but rather suggests that precisely because of the messy unevenness of life, its unfairness, unpredictability and imperfections, moments of what we may refer to as the sublime become precious as they emerge out of these struggles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, thank you for um, your appreciation, and uh, and uh, uh, you never you never disappoint. <laughs> thank you. That's you very kind. Deliver. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you. So I, I would like to move to our next contributor, um, Agnieszka Piotrowska. Uh, Agnieszka is uh, an award-winning filmmaker and a theorist. Uh, she's the head of school for film, media and performing arts and professor of film and cultural studies at the University for the Creative Arts, UK. She's also a visiting professor at, at, at Gdansk University, Poland. She's best known for a, her acclaimed documentary, Married to, to the Eiffel Tower, in, uh, that came out in 2009, screened globally in 60 countries. Uh, she has written extensively on psychoanalysis and cinema and is the author of the monographs Psychoanalysis and Ethics in Documentary Film, Black and White, Cinema, cinema Politics and the Arts in Zimbabwe, and The Nasty Woman, a Neo Femme Fatale in Contemporary Cinema. She has edited four books, including Femininity and Psychoanalysis and Creative Practice Research in the Age of Neoliberal Hopelessness. This is a founding scholar at the British Psychoanalytic Council. Agnieszka, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you again to the editors. And I know this is uh, customary to be saying thank you to the editors and thank you to everybody for coming. But really, thank you, because it's such a lovely project um, because it's transdisciplinary. And it's wonderful that in one space, you know, there are people from different disciplines um, film scholars like myself, uh, all kinds of philosophers, thinkers, and I think it is very special. It's it's a really nice, it's a really nice book. It's a book launch. We must be selling our book here. So I'm I'm saying to everybody, read it, use it in different ways, because I think its strength lies in different voices. And yet the theme is, as I mentioned to my colleagues here. Um, in my email, and then Polona uh, kindly mentioned it. It's, the theme is, is love, 
So my chapter is called The Sublime and the Feminine Jouissance. Um, and in it, I write about two films. One is the key film, I think, is The Fantastic Woman, which is the Oscar winning, winning film um, by Sebastian Lelio. But I also mention St. Teresa and another film, which I won't mention very much in this, um, which is The Untamed. And fundamentally, A Fantastic Woman is kind of, I begin with it and it's the key thing of which I write. I, I, I think it's an amazing piece of work. Um, I, I, I will probably write about it again because it's kind of endless um, treasure chest of ideas and feelings. And also it's a very beautifully and unusually made film. So in the chapter, I, um, I look at it in particular, but I also consider a variety of complicated theoretical um, concepts. And um, obviously the book is about the sublime, but I also look at the psychoanalytic concept of sublimation, uh, which our um, psychoanalytical friends, meaning we're all psychoanalytical friends, but meaning psychotherapists and psychoanalysts will know that famously a sublimation in Freud and Lacan is very much sublimation of the sex drive, sublimation of desire, but also sublimation of trauma um, of some sort. And the sublimation is, is a kind of positive defense, meaning that um, the without repression or suppression, you can do something with, with your drives that, it, that will be creative and that can be shared. The idea of that, it's, that it can be shared, that other people can partake in it is very important uh, altogether in that in the sort of sublimation, but also it's very important in, in my chapter and what I'm, what I'm trying to do here. So in the chat, so there is a, obviously um, the, the words, the sublime and sublimation are similar. Clearly they come from the same source, but they're clearly different. Um, and they mean sort of different things. So um, in my chapter, I look very much in general terms, in terms of the themes, I look at the connections and conflicts, if you like, between the body, the language, the pain, the pleasure, um, and then how this can work as a, as a sort of, as the sublime, if you like. So um, psychoanalytically, um, we know that Freud, of course, originally was talking about the sublimation of the suppressed sexual desire or, um, or drive originally in the hysterics and later about sublimation of pain and trauma of the shell shock soldiers. So talking about the bodily desires, bodily drives and sublimating them, translating them, if you like, so is the issue of translation into language. So that the pain, um, the desire, all kinds of things that maybe are unconscious and maybe we cannot control. And if we cannot realize them positively, they could be destructive. There's a possibility of translating them through talking mm -hmm. and therefore writing. And again, the idea is that we share. So it's also something that struck me as Polona was talking that somehow is the idea of the interconnectedness, which is so important. So um, very briefly, the film, A Fantastic Woman is a film at the heart of it is Marina, who is a transgender woman. She's not non-binary. She is, she wants to be a woman. She's a transgender woman who fundamentally suffers a huge loss. So the film is also about coming to terms with the loss. And she, her body is her great problem, her great concern, um, and the source of her suffering, because she suffers huge prejudice, discrimination, ugly, um, really ugly treatments in this kind of urban everyday, of which the book deals with, but as, as far as you can imagine uh, from any sublime, she's treated appallingly, She's beaten up, she's tortured, it's just all horrendous because fundamentally she doesn't, she doesn't really look like a woman. She wants to be a woman, she lives the, 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 the life of a woman, but her body is quite androgynous, but she insists on the fact that she's a woman and, and that's what, what it is. So in terms of the narrative of the, the film and what's relevant to what we're talking about, here is that she 
um, the, 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 I, I sort of opened the chapter with one of the final scenes in the film in which Marina goes to see her music teacher um, and he says, are you here to, to talk to me as your father figure or psychotherapist or are you here to sing? And she says, well, maybe everything, I don't know. And he says, well, I need to talk to you about something. And she says, oh, not the San Francis again. And he says, no, San Francis again, yes. And San Francis says when um, he prays to God, he doesn't pray for things for himself, but he says, let me be the channel of your love. Let me, let me make other people happy, I guess. And something happens uh, with, with Marina in the scene. And he, the teacher says, shall we sing? Can you sing then? And through this singing, um, something beautiful, sublime happens, which in the film goes into her uh, decision to, sh to, to, to give a public concert in which she appears um, less as in this kind of feminine persona, but as this beautiful androgynous person who sings beautifully, so beautifully that this is the moment of sublime uh, beauty. This is the moment of grace in which the, the body, her body, which to my mind is very beautiful, but to some people in the film was not, is not a, a, an issue at all of any kind because the issue is the beauty of her performance and the beauty of her intention to give love to people and now i think i've used up my five minutes so i think i won't be talking about saint christeva but but i am or, or saint teresa which christeva uh, writes about but just most briefly um of course um, saint teresa is is a saint she would never have been any saint. You would never have heard anything about her had she not sublimated her pain, suffering and desire into writing, into language. It is through the fact that there is a testimony of her um, autoerotic uh, experiences, one could say, which she gets, she got help from the uh, priests, Catholic priests at the time who said, hey, write it down. And if you don't, then we can't really um, defend you against the in, um, Holy Inquisition and you will be burnt on the stake. So she, she started with their help writing these things which we read. And so it's again a, a translation from the bodily experience into the language, which then becomes something we can share and which then becomes beautiful and can even be called grace. There you have it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka. That's a wonderful introduction to your chapter. And uh, uh, yes, indeed, this is. Um, you know, and Christopher perhaps also, who knows, maybe in the future she will be sanctified. Exactly, she yeah. probably will be, because that is a nice Freudian slip, of course. Yeah, nice Freudian slip. Yes, but she writes, you know, I think the point about it all is how important it is to be sharing, to be writing in the book, in this kind of event, but also simply with each other. Indeed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, now, um, if I may, I would like to uh, introduce Chris uh, Vlachopoulos. He's, uh, he's uh, a good friend uh, and also helped me enormously with the book. He also introduced me to Justin, who also became a very good friend <laughs> in the process. So this is also a book about friendship and, and uh, uh, making friends and uh, you know connecting uh, on the level of uh, of, of friendship and, and uh, love and, and, uh, and the sublime. So um, Chris uh, is, uh, has a background in psychology. He completed his studies at the University of Reading and uh, holds a Master of Arts from Goldsmiths College in writing for performance and dramaturgy. He's active in the theater as a playwright and, and as a playwright, he's adapted ancient Greek tragedies for the stage, such as Hecuba, and is an associate writer for Catharsis Theatre, and has the connection with Justin. Um, he has studied the work of contemporary playwrights extensively, particularly those adhering to the abstractist tradition of contemporary drama, as well as contemporary writers for postmodernist fiction. His uh, chapter, who um, 
he wrote very much uh, um, uh, in uh, to 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 fit the purposes of the book. Uh, is the sublime in Catch-22 as bridge between postmodern literature and psychoanalysis. Chris, uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anastasi. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, I know exactly as Agnieszka and Anna said, this is, this is a labor of love, truly. And it's so wonderful to be here to share it with all of you. Um, as I have experienced this book in a number of ways, mainly through my many, many conversations with Anastasis, and it's just been a wonderful journey to see it from its conception. Um, I, it makes complete sense that Anastasis would be editing a book about the sublime in literature. I know him to be a big lover of language and of storytelling, and he's been amazing in conversations about um, of great passions, which has been theater and just storytelling, which I think is so central to who we are. Um, when we first started talking about the sublime, uh, all I could talk about were the novels that I loved and love, and they mostly belong to the postmodern tradition, which seems to be something that a lot of people have quite a few misconceptions about. And it's one of those things that uh, people tend to react uh, a bit strongly against, mainly because they're not very well defined. Uh, for the purposes of this chapter, I just mainly spoke about postmodernism as any work of art or storytelling that seems to resist uh, single explanations and seems to embrace um, a, a variety of explanations for, for why we live the way we live today. And I thought of Catch-22 as a wonderful tool to talk about the sublime because it just so wonderfully uh, talks about the way institutions such as the army or what, education or whatever it may be, uh, why they sort of shape our lives in the way that they do. And the sublime being a moment in life where it's so difficult to define that I found it's as individual as we are. I found that in our conversations, people tend to define the sublime very, very differently. Um, so we talked a lot about how psychoanalysis and literature have coexisted for a very long time. And indeed, one could argue that literature has been one of our very first attempts at psychoanalyzing. And I found that as this tradition has been evolving, literature has been getting richer and richer, embracing more and more voices. Uh, it hasn't really followed postmodernism very much, um, at least not to an extent that I would have liked to see. And I think that this is a bit of a wasted opportunity uh, because the there's so much to learn, uh, mainly the fact that um, there are so many moments in life that just cannot be explained through one singular source. And Catch-22 being a text, a very foundational text for postmodernism, uh, it seems to anticipate a lot of what followed later, namely a sense of irreverence on the face of uh, difficulties and a sense of playfulness. Uh, and those are just very important lessons I find uh, when it comes to being practitioners of analysis or being better readers of literature or practitioners of theatre. Uh, one of the key words I was very, very happy to hear from Agnieszka was uh, interdisciplinary approach to things, and that is very much something that postmodernism embraces. So that is something that I would very much like to see more of in uh, analysis or literature itself. Um, being a writer myself, I tend to see in, in conversations that writers tend to be quite um, <laughs> difficult people to psychoanalyze, mainly because they consider themselves to be the main authority in the world that they create in the world of language they inhabit and to succumb quote unquote to a higher authority to explain certain why you might be reproducing certain patterns about yourself is something that a lot of writers are quite uncomfortable with and I would like to see that done a lot more. Uh, on the other side in my chapter I do explore a certain tendency from analysts in the past to um, interpret a lack of coherence as uh, psychopathologizing uh, as a sort of root of problems there. And actually that's, that, that's just a wasted opportunity I find in that um, the world is so much more interesting when we try to take uh, 
different approaches to things and listen to the marginalized and to other voices other than our own. Um, so that's something that postmodernism, I think, does really, really well. And Catch-22 in particular mixes those moments of high and low humor uh, with moments of incredible beauty and language and character uh, that I thought could be a really good starting point to encourage that conversation. So I was very, very happy to be a part of it. Thank you, Anastasia and Polona, for being so generous, such generous editors. And thank you so much for, for everything that you've taught me in the process. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you and thank you for all your help and, and uh, having you as part of the project, certainly enriched uh, both the project, the book and also our lives, my life, especially. <laughs> so, um, if, uh, if I may, I would like to move on to uh, our final presenter today uh, before I give my concluding thoughts and the, the summary of the book myself. This is Daniel Rubinstein. Daniel also, uh, I invited him uh, uh, last in, in, in the book, but uh, he's not the least. He's an exceptional writer himself with a, 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 a wonderful sort of background in philosophy and aesthetics. Uh, he, Daniel is a, a reader in philosophy and the image at Central St. Martins. He has written books and articles on European philosophy, visual cultures, queer theory, cyber cultures, and psychoanalysis. His most recent books are Photography After Philosophy and Fragmentation of Orthographic Image in the Digital Age. Um, Daniel has uh, his, uh, he had uh, before, before inviting his, uh, some ideas, some sketches of, of a chapter that he finalized through, uh, through the couple of months we worked together. But uh, the chapter is, is, uh, is a wonderful contribution and, uh, and a beautiful, sort of beautifully written and executed. Uh, is the, the Diogenes complex, sublime living in irrational times. Daniel, over to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Anastasia and Polona. Uh, and and it's, it's a honor and a pleasure to be in this, uh, in this event, uh, in this, uh, this book launch. And uh, I think that, you know, um, working with both of you was a wonderful experience and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be part of that and for, um, for all your support uh, throughout this process. Um, so, um, at first, I was not so sure about writing a chapter about the sublime because I, I thought this, the sublime already had its day in court, and and I didn't see what if what, you know, what role it plays in the travails of the twenty first century, um, um, and the first thing I thought about was this uh, room in the Tate Britain that has the sublime paintings. I don't know if you're familiar with the genre of. Uh, you know, a group of travelers on the, on the precipice of a mountain just at the moment when the avalanche is about to hit or a boat on, you know, on the top of the ninth wave, you know, um, in, the, in the middle of a storm. Uh, obviously, experience is as removed from the everyday as you can imagine. Um, and, um, and then I thought that perhaps there is something to say about trying to reformulate the sublime for this period of always on 24 hour non-stop communication uh, and uh, technologies of uh, instantaneity. In other words, perhaps there is something sublime in the encounter that we are having right now. Maybe this, this digital presence and absence, this, this sort of intimate co-presence at a distance has some kind of sublime um, element about it that is sort of uh, worth exploring. And also it's fascinating to think the implications of this sublimity, if there is such a thing, um, to therapeutic practices. I looked at the figure. Hello. Because Hello. Of the scenic Oh, sorry, Daniel, you just froze in a little bit. Just, yeah. Oh. Is that okay? Did yeah. I, did I uh, defrost? Yeah, you defrost, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, the scenic philosophers, the dogs, 
Um, they're called cynics because they point to the dog to say, look at the dog, has no mortgage, no pension fund, you know, it's happy, you know, licking its own genitals, you know, and, and absolutely content. Why can't we be the same? If it is good for the dog, why wouldn't it be good for us? And this is what Foucault calls stylistics of existence. So what is so fascinating for me about the, the cynics and Diogenes in, 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 in particular is that their teachings are not about syllogisms um, or how one should live one's life. Rather, they just practice it and they let you learn by observing the cynic philosopher who has nothing, maybe like a cloak and a stick and the lid in the jar. Um, and he's healthy, he's happy, his eyes are radiant and his, his you know, sarcasm is, uh, is poisonous, you know, and everything is as, as it should be. Um, and in that way, the cynic um, offers their own life as a form of a discourse. So within the cynics, there is no distinction between thinking and being. It is the same, you know, as, as Parmenides speculated, as Heidegger uh, later on um, kind of put forward, this notion that the, the, the two realities, the inner reality and the external one, are not two separate dialectically opposed entities, but one and the same. So that seemed to me quite radical and interesting. And maybe something like that is happening in the sublime moment, which perhaps for the 21st century can be considered as the glitch in the matrix, as the moment when, you know, you realize that everything is just, you know, a kind of a simulation, a virtual reality thing, like what we have now, you know, on this screen, you know, because where exactly are you in this environment? You know, if I take a screwdriver and open this screen, I will not see you behind, even though you seem to be just here, you know, like I can almost touch you, but, but at the same time, you're here and not here. So how to grasp this irreality of, of the real? So it seems to me that Diogenes offers a way of doing that through a form of practice, which is which has no trace of theorizing about it, through a form of living your life um, in a specific way. So that that what um, excited me about Diogenes. There is a story that um, he was um, um, because he was living in the barrel and in Corinth, he was sort of masturbating in the marketplace, and the, the, the people chided him for you know kind of doing this kind of thing in public. And he said, well, if only I could satisfy my hunger likewise by rubbing my belly. And that really is um, very essentially what cynicism is about. And maybe I will stop here because Anastasia has also asked not to say, not to tell you too much about what the book is about because um, they still want you to buy it, you know? So maybe I will stop. Well, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It was, uh, and also the, we, we experienced such a glitch, sublime glitch at the moment, but thankfully we had you back. Okay? So it was, it was rescued, you know, the virtual reality didn't disappoint as you didn't disappoint as well with your wonderful chapter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like now to offer my concluding thoughts on this event. As previous contributors have mentioned, this book is a work of love. Love as a sublime event in its different forms and emanations. It began with the love of wisdom, the love of truth, and then moved to the truth of love. The love as it is expressed in poetry, literature, film, theater, play, and most importantly, in, as it is experienced in our interactions with friends, comrades, lovers, and companions. It is because of these sublime interactions with friends and companions, both past and present, dead and alive, that this book has come into existence. First, my dear friend Tessa, who began this project with me almost 12 years ago, and then my very good friend Polona, who stepped in as a co-editor and saved this project when Tessa was no longer, no longer alive. All of the contributors are also friends, or they have become so through the process of working together to produce this book over the last two years. 
Of course, this book will not have been possible without the love and support of my dear wife, Sasha, whose sublime presence has been a constant source of inspiration to me over the years. Thank you. For the sublime, as it is conceived in our book, is not simply an individualistic event that introduces greatness into the ordinary and the mundane. It is based on experiences that are shared and have the power to elevate us together. As I will shortly demonstrate with some examples, the everyday sublime is not a singular feat that we strive for as individuals, but it is also an uncommon goal, a value that could be held jointly and lead to change. I remember as a young man in my early 20s, after having had my first serious breakup, sitting on a bench, looking melancholic while waiting for the bus to arrive. An old lady who was also waiting for her bus sat next to me, touched my hand softly and said, please don't worry, my son. In life, you will experience joy and sorrow in equal measure. She then stood up, continued her past and disappeared, never to be seen again. It took this moment of sublime grace and connection to make me realize that nothing in life is permanent, not even my worries. To live with this uh, transience, this lack of permanence, is to love what is mortal. But how could one love what is mortal when the crematoria are, are running out of wood to burn the corpses? How can one love what uh, is mortal in a time where there is so much destruction and violent death? This seems to be a nightmare from which we cannot awake unless we deal with the haunting memories of those who died in vain. This is not only an issue of sublimation, of turning this nightmare into a dream, the primary objective of psychoanalytic therapy. This is also a matter of truth and social justice. To the living, we owe respect, but to the dead, we owe only the truth, said Voltaire. So at times, it feels as if writing about love during or after the pandemic could be seen as barbaric, to paraphrase Adorno, an act of cruel indifference to suffering, to the suffering of others. Yet not to write at all would mean to deny, to deny that perennial suffering has as much right to expression as the tortured have to scream. At least this act of sublimation gives some form to suffering, a contrast to the repressive disublimation which maintains our careless apathy by thoughtlessly evacuating our pain onto and into others. But what is the relation of the sublime in writing and art to the other suffering? Is it similar to the one described by Odin's poem, Musée de Beaux-Arts? In the poem, Odin describes Bruegel's painting, landscape with the fall of Icarus, and people's indifference towards the fallen boy Icarus in the following characteristic way. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position. How it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking duly along. In Broigel Sicarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. In order to overcome indifference, the sublime disposition that Odin reflects and prescribes here is one that attempts to acquire some distance, to be at one remove, like the old masters, or perhaps two steps removed, like Odin himself was, from the suffering so as to be able to witness it. It is like looking at the sun through a glass darkly. Otherwise we will be blinded or worse to take Icarus uh, fall as a warning, we will fly too close to the sun 
the wax will melt, we will lose our wings, fall into the sea and drown. However, although we cannot observe suffering for a long time without blinking an eye, we do not also have to turn a blind eye to it by turning it into a contemporary primal sin. Perhaps with uh, different levels of awareness, it is likely that people still experience physical reactions to direct or indirect trauma and suffering within their environments, and not in the pit of their stomach when they hear that refugees are treated as illegal aliens, a pain in the lower back when they experience someone complaining is a customer that requires a specific service, as it, re as it reflects when they see people flaunting their privilege without any consideration for its effects on their fellow human beings, and losing breath when they can only find scraps of time to spend with their friends and family, when they are overwhelmed with these useless, mind-numbing administrative tasks. Perhaps we have all become veritable hysterics. However, unlike the hysterics of Freud's time, we do not have the time to reflect on and process this physicality, which as a consequence becomes fleeting and transitory. Though certain works of art, through and, you know, via certain works of art, that manage to arrest this transitoriness and express suffering in ways that we cannot escape from or ignore, ignore anymore, we can regain the opportunity to encounter suffering in a different form and process it more effectively. Apart from these works of art, I believe that psychoanalysis also serves the same aesthetic function. It cultivates a science, an art of sensibility that attends to the suffering mind, body, and the current shocks inflicted uh, on it by the administered world. I'm also very aware of the dangers of concealment in the adoption of life informed by the aesthetic dimension without having an awareness of social and structural inequalities. I remember driving on the motorway with Tessa. There were roadworks everywhere. We were, we were unnecessarily delayed. I was irritated. She said, look, Anastasius, just look. Aren't they beautiful? What is beautiful, Tessa? I don't understand. The roadworks, you silly. What else? And she went on to describe the exceptional symmetrical arrangement of the pylons and traffic cones that made the whole artificial landscape so aesthetically pleasing. I was struck by her ability to not simply observe, but to look, really look, and find what is beautiful and sublime, even in the most mundane and frankly deeply frustrating aspects of everyday reality. I thought she was blessed with a kind of vision that could make the world sacred again. But I was also aware of the real suffering that this aesthetic gesture could potentially conceal. I was aware of its ideological nature if it is not followed by an awareness of the toil and pain of the workers involved in the road works themselves. When I began writing my chapter on love as a sublime event, I had a sense that I was lost for words. These, these were words that were lost but were never there. Words that were yet to come. Words that if I allowed myself enough time, they would have appeared again to live in truth with love. I suppose this is what makes loss so difficult to bear. You do not lose only what you had, but also what you had become if you hadn't lost it. But of course, this is also a fantasy, as if these words could ever be completely found. Yet I feel it is inf it's important to allow one's words to be lost for a while and not try to tie them to a mast. And there are plenty of political masts that people tie their words on. It is important not to pin one word down too quickly. You see, words are like angels. And if you put, pin them down too quickly, they lose their wings and die, to paraphrase Virginia Woolf. Stop. Enough. Stop. I can hear Tessa saying it to me. When it comes to love, you need to do what will cost you the most. 
I remember feeling puzzled by this answer she gave me when I asked her whether I should stay in a relationship that could potentially cause me a lot of pain. It is only years later that I came to realize that if I had succumbed to the calculus of neoliberal dating, I would have missed on years of precious connection and mutual generosity. As Mary Oliver says in her short poem, The Uses of Sorrow, Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. Thank you. Anastasius, that was beautiful. So, um, if I turn to the to our uh, to the participants, if they would like to ask any questions, please use uh, the reactions button and raise your hand, or you can do it by using the chat. A lot to digest and take in yes. from all the presentations, I think. Yes. Well, now I can I can speak. Yes. 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 Please. Yes. I just want to to tell the future readers that I was a former reader and I was tickled, as Polona said, in her chapter by each chapter of the book. I entered. And my pleasure to answer Annette, uh, Anne Seymour question. My pleasure was to be there now and see your face because I already dialogued with you. I took my pen, if you see my book, it's all scratched with, you know, comments and, and I know you and now I can see you. And it's a very, very uh, rich book because with this, Sublime, we say in French, not sub sublime, we say sublime, l'anginus. Uh, it's a word which federates so different practices. I mean, when it's a, a question of ordinary life, it's also practical. You know, mm. how in our different practices we meet something which is a strong weaving process between all your and my, my practice. So it's a tool. It, this book is a tool. Uh, uh, that's, uh, I, uh, I am now thinking always how I could use what you brought me to uh, name things that I don't very well name in my own practice of psychoanalysis. Those moments which are, as you say, like marvels you know, yes. and you forget them right away. Well, not right away, but they don't stay because after, or, or again, the problems and so on. And I'm going to write them down because they are the art. They are the essence. No, I don't like the word. No, they are the uh, exquisite moment of art in my work. Therapeutic art is not for every day. Uh, I mean, it's routine and so on. But there are moments which are sublime. And I think, well, I love Catch-22. And I was so pleased to have this. Well, I, I could talk to each of you. But <laughs> I will not. And long, oh, OK, that's it. So buy the book. <laughs> Thank you, Francois. Thank you. It's a wonderful endorsement. Thank you. I think that's what we were hoping for, kind of ex experiential book that doesn't just think, but moves. Yes. Hmm. You succeeded. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to ask or speak or make a comment or... I don't know if perhaps our other contributors that didn't present want to say something. Onel, oh, I can see Onel being here. I want to say, ah. 
perhaps something about their paper. I also, I can see that Mark also, me, he also endorsed the book and Mark is a, is a good friend, a colleague and my supervisor in New York. Hello, Mark. <laughs> It's wonderful to have him. He also is one of the people who endorsed the book together with Francois Davoine and, uh, and uh, uh, Isabel Hendon, who is a colleague of mine, was a colleague of mine in Regents College. So I just, uh, so wonderful to have you here. Thank you very much. Yeah? Oh, here we got someone. Well, Anastasis, can I just say that um, I'm going to try and get the book for the library, um, even though, uh, you know, it's kind of psychoanalytically minded rather than, I suppose, art and, and cultural. So I ask yeah. all academic friends to do the same and order the book for the library. In terms of, you know, um, insisting on people having a conversation now, maybe if they don't feel like it, then it's okay too. And yeah, we we'll just um, enjoy the fact that, you know, we've kind of met, had a few interesting comments and thoughts, and then we can re-meet again, I'm sure, in different ways and in different, mm -hmm. um, different meetings. And for, we can also just say, okay, that was wonderful. And, Go and enjoy our pleasures, as Anna Simo said. And one of the, mine was definitely food. <laughs> I just okay. want to add something. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I, I was speaking with a Belgium analyst and we had a meeting tonight. I said, I can't, I go to the meeting about the sublime, a wonderful book. And she was enthusiastic. So you should translate it in French or try to sell it in Belgium because <laughs> It was, it was a topic which mm. right away, uh, I'm not joking, it was very serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I, I, I believe it, but that will depend if uh, Routledge and, you know, we yeah. like to, 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 to translate it and, you know, we are open, of course we are. <laughs> but, it's true that a lot of the ideas, that, at the very least, that I spoke about were translated from French. I mean, a lot of uh, the work of uh, Jacques Lacan informed what I wrote about. So there's already an act of translation there, um, which would be very interesting to see finding its way back in the original, uh, how that little transmigration would go. Uh, but thank you so much for your kind words. Well, Nell, I can see you. I, I, I just managed to pin you and I found you. Hello. Hi there. Like, say, I can see. I can see that you managed to to make it. I'm sorry I wasn't able to to mention you before. I didn't think that you would be able to make. But it's such a great pleasure to have you here. So would you like to say a few words, maybe? You need to unmute or no? Have you unmuted? Let's see if that works. Yeah. Is that better? Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just just want to thank thank um, both both of you for um, for what you've what you've done in, uh, or been, been the editors of the book. Um, I I haven't read it all, but um, of course I'm totally biased, and I think think it's a, think it's a great book. I think there's lots of stuff there that I want to read because it's it's actually physically very pretty, and I looked at it on my shelf and thought, oh, oh, you know, be be great to read a, read that book. So. But um, I'm afraid I don't have very much substantial to say about it, um, apart from what what's, what sounds more like an advert. But I think think it's um, it, uh, just a very important topic. Thank you, thank you, Nell. Yeah, I mean, you, thank you for mentioning the cover because in, in the cover is one of the paintings of Tessa actually that we included. So it's uh, it's actually the book is devoted to her memory and the. Uh, the painting is uh, Tessa's painting that we managed to include, take a photograph and include it as part of it. So thank you for mentioning that. It indeed is a very attractive looking book as well. <laughs> I can I can see in the group a few uh, people from the network that 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 
I've been running, which is psychoanalysis in our time, but I'm not going to force them to speak, but just to say that maybe when we start when we start meeting again in person, we can we can invite some of the people who are here. We can talk some more about uh, the sublime and and bodies and language and translation. So we have already a ready-made topic for another for another meeting, perhaps. Yep. Well, one purpose of this last session wasn't just to have a question, questions and answers, but just to celebrate um, in a way that we could perhaps um, do it in person better um, with just having a chat and a, a glass of wine. Um, so it doesn't have to be a discussion about the book necessarily. Yeah. There is someone who raised their hand and there are two people who raised their hand. Yeah. I cannot quite see. One was me. Um, I'm not sure about the other one. Hi, I just wanted to say um, what a wonderful evening. And I guess what it evoked in me is thinking about my own history. It's lovely to see some classicists here and dramatists and Anna is a drama therapist and um, got me thinking about when I originally, my kind of career history and I was originally torn between quote unquote classics and the arts and quote unquote therapy and what's been so wonderful is being brought back to an awareness that actually they're you know they're one and the same the you know, Greek tragedy is sort of the original psychoanalysis and you know, humanity laid bare so viscerally um and actually lovely and through Francoise's comments as well to to really connect to the beauty and the poetry of the work that we have the privilege of doing and likewise I want now to really be alert to those moments of connection and poetry and beauty in my work and to, you know, to really sit with them and to really celebrate them. And actually it's particularly lovely to have an evening like this in the midst of the pandemic. And I think in the midst of a culture where we're so much, if you're mentioning sort of 24 seven culture when we're so much perhaps in our heads, especially in the Western world. So to be encouraged to be with our hearts has been wonderful. So thank you and thank you very much for inviting me. I look forward to reading the book in its totality. Well, thank you, Helen. Uh... Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see you here as well, and uh, uh, Helen and I have been colleagues at Regents, uh, and uh, we work together, and uh, it's uh, such a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you for your kind words. I'm also unmuting Mark Gerald. Thank you. Is it working? Mark, yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I, uh, I'm so glad to be here with you, Anastasios. Uh, I am uh, in New York uh, at the moment, so it's late there. I'm so happy to see uh, new colleagues who are overlapping interests with me. And Francois, who I never met, just listening to you is a sublime experience. Uh, thank you for your words. Uh, I, I also, uh, and thank you, Polona, for uh, defining that this part of the, uh, of the evening is to celebrate. And I do, uh, I, I want to celebrate all of you who contributed to the book. I, I only know you, Anastasios, but uh, it's, uh, it's always sublime to be with you. I wish we were together in person. That will happen sometime. Uh, in the future, and um, congratulations to all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That's uh, that's wonderful, and thank you very much for for endorsing the book and uh, being such a sublime presence in my life as well. Yeah, uh, over the years. <laughs> it's uh, so it's so great to have you here, and you're able to make it tonight. Yes. There's a question. There is a question actually from one of my ah. students. So oh, I guess that you want to read it out. Well, no, you read it out. You're the editor. All right. Uh, a quick question to all presenters. Has writing for this book contributed to your ability to discover the sublime, love in ordinary things? Right. Well, you know, I think I think uh, I think the love in ordinary things was was uh, and uh, and uh, the everyday was was already there and I think that's that was the the point of the book in a way mentioning these stories about this about this old lady approaching me and giving me you know and and, and having these moments of connection 
which are moments, you know, a kind of uh, everyday grace, they, they, they transform you. They, they give you a different perspective and they make you realize that, that life is, is uh, has, uh, you know, has uh, a lot of darkness, but uh, in the moments of darkness, in these bins of darkness, there are, there are also quite incredible uh, moments of uh, connectivity and uh, transcendence too. So here we are. <laughs> That's my my reply, um, and actually made me uh, reading reading uh, the contributions of the other contributors uh, as well in the book made me enriched my knowledge of the sublime in the different fields they work. So that was also a, 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 a fantastic sort of uh, development in my knowledge and my uh, and uh, the, the extension to. Uh, interdisciplinary sort of knowledge at that point. So it was, it was, it was a fantastic experience. For me. May I just offer, um, yeah, a really interesting question actually. Um, and the answer for me, I think was yes, really, in a way that I hadn't really, I wouldn't really have expected. I think I remember an occasion when I was um, walking along a sort of very dark cycle path at night in London, listening to a song by Tori Amos and something just sort of clicked uh, in the way that you sort of associate with an experience of the sublime. And I sort of went, oh, this is, oh, this is that. Uh, and there was sort of something about this, the sort of solitude of this moment and the sort of night sky and the sort of city all lit up around me that I sort of wouldn't have identified as an, ex as an encounter with the sublime, quote unquote, uh, prior to doing this volume, but which in the writing of actually doing it, I actually would, did. Um, I think I also, I tried to kind of force myself to make sure that if I talked about the sublime, I related it back to any sort of subjective experiences of my own that I would connect with it. And that's something that I tried to sort of stay true to in my chapter which um, made me sort of reclassify or kind of re-catalogue my own experiences in quite an interesting way that I wasn't really expecting. So that was quite a nice, nice discovery. Um, and actually, funnily enough, and this is something that sort of comes up in, in my chapter, um, there's a place where Longinus kind of accidentally almost denies a particular description of an experience uh, sublimity. It's the idea of a group of audience members um, sort of experiencing something, to, a sort of shared trauma moment together in, in a theatre. And Longinus is not keen to uh, describe this as sublime, uh, like I said, but, um, but the moment that he's describing very much sort of sounds like it. And again, it's a sort of weird, almost Freudian slip of a moment in this text. And as a sort of theatre maker myself, I think I, we've probably all kind of sat in a theatre at some point and felt the moments where, the moments where, again, like I say, it clicks and the sort of collectivity of theatre kicks in about a moment and something is there in the right place and the right time, the right group of people performed in the right way that sort of sparks something quite magical in that space. Um, and again, I... Um, prior to, to working on this volume, I wouldn't necessarily have uh, identified those experiences uh, that I felt in my, as, a, as an audience member and as a maker uh, in the theatre as that. But, but again, this is, uh, uh, working on this has, has been an interesting different tool to, to sort of think with for me. So no, thank you. So can I, um, can I quickly say, um... Uh, can I share that when Polona, uh, so I know Polona, I've known Polona for a while, for a long time actually, because we were at Bergberg and Polona in fact finished her PhD at Bergberg when I started as it happens. Um, and so, and we, we've, which is the lovely thing about that is that we, so we've actually known each other for something like 10 years. 12 <laughs> years or something or 10 years at least. And I think that and, and we, it's not like we are in touch all the time, but we are in touch regularly and not maybe as often as I'd like to be in touch, but we are in touch. And so when Polona says, oh, would you like to contribute to the book? I said, yes, yes, sure. And then I wrote the abstract and Polona says, ah, oh, 
interesting. I wonder how you can make it all work together. I said, that's the point. And then it's the different aspects of it. And let's see what happens. And through, and she says, well, have a go and see. And through working on it, um, I've reflected profoundly on, yes, on connections between body and language, which I'm interested in anyway, and I work on it. But it certainly mm -hmm. made me reflect further. And when I use the word grace, and I'm not at all a religious person, and I use the word grace in my chapter, I thought, oh my goodness me, what's happening here? But I think, as you say, Anastasia, the sublime does connect to, to the notion of grace, yes whether you're religious or not. That's what we're talking about. The moment, as you just mentioned, Justin, when you suddenly, is this the, 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 oce the oceanic moment, the moment you think I'm in, in one with the word briefly, and you know, this will do. I think, I think that um, one, one of the things for me is, um, is that I think I try to sidestep the, the term the sublime a bit. And I try to, I think I'm a bit more worried about about the language, and I'm more more preoccupied with the dif the difference between um, uh, between our experience in something as ordinary and our experience in it as extraordinary, and the difference between things that we think we can represent with words and things that seem to overflow the words, and and I don't think I don't think my practice has changed as a as um, a result of writing it, but I think I'm. I'm more, I'm more, more consciously preoccupied with those sort of things as a, as time goes on. Yeah, I mean that's something I wanted to allude to in my introduction that I was kind of uneasy with the word because it seems so ambitious, and um, at the same time private <laughs> that you can't necessarily share. Um, so perhaps this book was a way to to accepting it as a name for some experiences. That, that has definitely been a thing uh, I've learned in this process. Uh, that how much people vary in the in their definitions of the sublime, and uh, how actually someone's experience of the sublime can be entirely ordinary for someone else, and uh, e even tortuous. Uh, and uh, Anastasia, one of the names that kept coming up in our discussions was William Blake and that famous quote that kept coming up, um, to see a world in a grain of sand, uh, the, the one that you've memorized so well and which I always get wrong. Could you remind us? <laughs> I can't remember this now. I mean, <laughs> yeah, of, course. of course, but yeah, like the main point was that how individual that moment is really, and it's as unique as we are. Uh, so for me, whenever about whenever I try to think about the sublime, I try to just listen to what people will say, and try to let go of my own preconceptions. So that that's been one of the lessons that I've learned. And thank you for the wonderful question. Mm. Yes, definitely. I, can, yes, sorry, can, I just, can I just make a, a, a brief contribution to this? Um, I think what's really interesting is the fact that we're having this conversation in the time of pandemic, where We've all been living in this state of such social and physical isolation from each other. And actually all those vicarious moments of contact have, have dissipated. And so much of our contact now is very controlled in terms of making very definite times of meeting via Zoom. And the nature of the contact is so different. And I guess, I, I guess that also means that things become more precious in different kinds of ways and perhaps more intensified and, and, um, and more refined. Hmm. Thank you, thank you, Anna. For me, uh, if anything, uh, it's, it's the, the experience of doing this book and as I, as I mentioned, uh, connecting with friends and and having the, the support of a friends, colleagues, companions, my wife, this is actually what what makes my life sublime. You know, it's, it's these connections, these moments, even now, I think having your wonderful contributions, having the, the opportunity, even, you know, I haven't met Agnieszka in, in person and I hope one day I will, uh, or Francoise, uh, you know, or 
Uh, I met all the other, but there is. It would be it would be wonderful to to have the opportunity to to see you in person. But actually, even meeting you now and knowing that there is so much, uh, there's been so much support and so much so much uh, uh, wonderful contribution on your part. It's just uh, it changes things, it alters it. And you know, when I invited uh, Daniel and Justin to do that in a kind of last last minute, and they said yes, it was just. It was just wonderful, and you know, and uh, and having all the other contributions as well, and uh, the, uh, how how amazing that was uh, for me. You know, this is this is the moment, the moment of connection, the moment of of uh, of, of change, and the moment of, of support. Thank you very much uh, for tonight, and thank you very much for your contributions, and and mm -hmm. all the participants. Thank you for attending uh, our book launch. Um, uh, there is a, there's a question here if there will be a, um, if the recording will be shared. Um, uh, I will I will share the recording yes uh, with the participants and also I will send a flyer with a twenty percent discount uh, with uh, by email to all the participants. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you to everyone and uh, <laughs> have a good yeah. evening. And thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, lovely seeing you. All. Lovely seeing you. Bye. 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 Uh,